Okay, great. Um, also, what I would say again, in keeping with the spirit of the, the introduction, uh, please um, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask a question if anything comes up. I always think it's much better for everybody to be kept in the loop of what's going on. And, and you know, if you're not, not understanding something, it's quite likely others aren't as well. So um, yeah, please just feel free to cut in at any point and interject and we can kind of discuss discuss the question. Um, but yeah, but, but I'll, um, I'll get to it. Um, so a slightly kind of provocative, grandiose, um, dramatic sentence here uh, to start off with, which is unifying ML with one line of code. And throughout the talk, I will try to justify that this is um, actually relatively um, feasible with, with the way we're designing things. And really what this, um, what this is saying is that users will only need to add one line of code in order to unify the frameworks. But of course, we need to write more than one line of code in order to make that possible. Um, yeah, so to, to make a start then, so basically what Ivy is striving to be is effectively kind of a, a, a one line of code solution that enables functions and modules from any framework to interchangeably run together. So you can take a function or a module from a library and just kind of mix and match these and choose whatever framework you want and just run them all seamlessly regardless of the framework or the framework version um, that you're kind of picking and mixing and matching uh, all of the code from. Um, so I'll quickly give an overview of kind of what the talk will entail. Basically, I'll first go through a relatively high level overview of what Ivy does. Um, then I'll talk a bit about how Ivy fits into the wider ML stack, giving a lot of credit to a lot of the other great unification work that's been done. Um, I'll then, although this number's wrong, that should be three. <laughs> um, I'll then uh, talk a bit about how Ivy is able to serve these two quite different roles of being a framework and a transpiler using some core building blocks. I'll then talk a bit about Ivy as a framework and how that's implemented. I'll then talk quite a bit more about Ivy as a transpiler and how this is going to look before then finally talking a bit about where Ivy could go in the future and also uh, give thanks to our growing team who've all helped a lot with this talk and, and the whole Ivy project. Um, so this is kind of a broad overview of what we'll be going through. Um, so to start with, Ivy in a nutshell, let's first answer the question, what does Ivy do? You'll have to excuse the graphic, this is, uh, maybe I should get a professional designer in at some point, but this is an image I made, um, basically showing kind of what the situation is for a researcher, a small startup, an enterprise, or whatever, and um, kind of showing that there is framework lock-in for any of these people. So you kind of need to choose what framework do we want to use. If you use PyTorch, perhaps you get access to better third-party libraries and the strong ecosystem built around it. If you use JAX, you have access to all of the state-of-the-art models from DeepMind. You also have more powerful and flexible gradient computation for Hessians, Jacobians, etc. You also have direct bindings to high-performance TPUs with it sitting very closely above XLA. With TensorFlow, you have kind of the industry inertia. You have very strong bindings to um, edge devices and mobile devices with TF Lite, for example. So all of these have like their own strengths and weaknesses, and you kind of need to compromise on losing out on some of these in order to um, get what you want from the framework of choice. The idea is with Ivy, this is really not necessary. All of these tools and code and framework is at your fingertips at any point in time, and you don't need to kind of worry about making compromises on your framework choice. You can kind of just use everything at any point in time. Um, and to flesh this out with a slightly more concrete example, so what happens today is a hot off the press paper comes out. I mean, if I'd made these slides yesterday, maybe this would be stable diffusion. You would see something similar. But basically what happens is a load of open source developers do great kind of altruistic work in, in implementing this in all of the various frameworks. But because the devil is in the detail in ML, this inevitably leads to um, small deviations from the original. Um, maybe it doesn't quite train or converge properly because you've got the initializer wrong. This is very tedious and hard to debug. So there's inevitably a ton of issues a ton of pull requests and a lot of developers and a lot of hours spent just trying to recreate the original. Whereas with Ivy, the idea is with one line of code, you can make all of this process a, a thing of the past. 
we can just convert the original Haiku JAX model to a Torch module in one line of code with, with unit testing that guarantees that the model is identical. And then you can go and train this in your Torch optimizer or whatever. So this is quite a concrete example of the kind of kind of acceleration and prototyping that the Ivy enables. Um, the other point to make is that Ivy is not just a transpiler and to demonstrate the utility of Ivy as a framework, we've created um, some applied libraries in fields like mechanics, vision and robotics that just show how you can use Ivy functions and drag and drop these into any existing project. For example, you can have a project that's kind of 90% TensorFlow code, but you want to use Ivy Vision to do a coordinates to voxel grid um, projection function, for example. Um, and we've made a few functions, but in general, people in the machine learning community can go and build all kinds of libraries with the confidence that their libraries and their functions will be usable by everybody. So this is kind of another way that Ivy can be used. Um, and to flesh this out with an example, I won't go into the details of this, but this is effectively showing how we can use Ivy for gradient-based uh, motion planning. And actually, this is a, a pipeline showing how we implemented a demo of this. And in fact, um, mm. I, I can quickly show you a couple of videos for this as well. Uh, basically, um, yeah, there's just these kind of um, uh, GIFs showing uh, gradient-based motion planning demo we did with the drone and also one we did with the manipulator, all kind of as pure Ivy functions in the vision and the robotics libraries that we've added. Um, yeah, so so I think that's kind of the, the high level of what Ivy does in, in a nutshell. Um, any, well, I'll get to the end of section one and then kind of open up for questions in, intermittently. I think that might be a, a good way of doing it. So, um, so plowing on then, so, First, let's think about how Ivy works as a transpiler. Excuse me. Um, so basically what we have are these framework specific backends, the um, centralized unified API of Ivy, which has one function accepting all tensor types. It has unified syntax and call signature. Um, and again, I'll explain this more in more detail soon, but it has no overhead effectively. Uh, and this is kind of a unified API we have, and we've represented it here with clip. And then we have framework specific implementations of this API. And then importantly, what we do as well is we implement framework specific front ends on top of Ivy. And these effectively mimic the original functional APIs of the frameworks, but instead of being wrapped on top of C++ or something, we wrap Ivy's API. And this effectively enables Ivy's functional API to act as an intermediate representation, which enables us to transpile arbitrarily from any front-end API to any back-end API. Um, so adding TensorFlow code to a PyTorch project then looks something like this. Um, and then with regards to Ivy as a framework, um, what we do is we effectively only wrap the functional APIs of these frameworks. So we kind of remove these reinvented wheels, which are the um, stateful APIs of the frameworks where there are trainable modules and optimizer classes and layers and things like this. Um, these are all the slightly more turbulent parts of the code. The, the functional APIs of the frameworks have very strong forwards and backwards compatibility requirements, which actually means that this is quite a stable piece of code to wrap. And in fact, over the last two years or so, not once have we had to change a unit test as a result of an updated version of one of these frameworks. So this makes for a very stable area to wrap. And then we re-implement the stateful um, classes and modules purely as a composition of the functional API, and we don't wrap this kind of code here. Um, so yeah, this is like high level what Ivy's design looks like as a framework. Um, so that is that's that is Ivy in a nutshell. What I'll now talk about a bit is how Ivy, um, is how Ivy sits in with regards to the machine learning stack. Um, so but before that, I will just quickly uh, ask if there are any questions. I'm very happy to answer answer anything that's come up as a question so far. Yes. So, so I think the first thought is that, um, the first point is that uh, Ivy's, Ivy by design doesn't require 
kind of third party buy-in. Uh, we don't ask people to create their own bindings to Ivy's API. We effectively wrap around the functional API. So even if this kind of a closed source framework that doesn't want to be compatible, uh, kind of Ivy's positioned and designed in such a way that we can kind of wrap the API and, and be that intermediate representation in between. The other point more importantly perhaps is that Earn X is focused predominantly on um, runtime flexibility. I think it's a really necessary and complementary tool, but the idea very much is to kind of train the network first, then have this static file format that's this very useful intermediate representation, which can then mean it's deployed on lots of hardware. I know it is possible to then load that in um, to some extent, but um, certainly the coverage of functions that ONNX has, it's much more neural network focused and not kind of an exhaustive arbitrary tensor computing API and and also not really focused on being able to just retrain models in new frameworks. So, so I think um, these are some of the biggest differences. And actually, it's interesting you ask that question because it, it's very much actually what is discussed as well, a little bit in the ML stack, where we, we talk about Ivy in the context of Owen and X and many other great works. But, but I think Ivy kind of sits higher up the stack and, and therefore um, it is a much more, it's a much better designed for enabling training time agnosticism and, and translations, I think. What one thing I can say, one thing I can say, I, I, I'll keep going, but one thing I can say about ML specific framework, just latching onto that part of the question is that, um, I mean, Ivy is, is not necessarily ML specific, actually. It's much more about array processing and tensor processing. So, um, I mean, of course, ML is all built on tensor operations, but, but Ivy, uh, yeah, but, but Ivy is, um, I would say, less ML focused than ONNX because ONNX is kind of very much on neural networks, whereas whereas Ivy tries to cover the whole um, the whole kind of tensor processing API uh, quite exhaustively. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. So I'll 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 crack on then. So um, da da da. Uh, so yeah, with regards to the ML stack, um, the first point, again, slightly <laughs> dramatized, but uh, just talking a bit about a framework explosion. Um, so particularly kind of in the last few years or so, I mean, 2014 is kind of the, the more recent bit on the dial that we go back to. The, there are a lot of frameworks, basically. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, I won't go through all of them. Um, I think maybe kind of the story that is most relevant among all of these going on, I mean, is Julia, which is a, a great language that's much better designed, actually, with its just-in-time compilation and its natural um, parallelism than Python. So I think that's an interesting one to, to kind of watch and, and flux as well. But um, But basically, kind of one of the main stories, I suppose, is that there was cafe being used a lot, but it was all C++. TensorFlow came out, made things quite easy with a kind of Python first interface, but the, the fully static graph made things quite hard to debug. You didn't really have access to the intermediate representations without going inside um, the, the TF sessions. PyTorch then had an opening to, to be more Pythonic with its asynchronous scheduling onto the GPUs, um, meaning that you could incorporate dynamic control flow very naturally into the, the execution of of, uh, of, of networks. Um, JAX has then found its place because of its fully functional design that means it's easier to debug things even further when you can step through kind of gradients and everything in a very functional manner, compute arbitrary high order gradients, very efficient on TPUs. So they all find their place. There's also the DEX language being created by the original creator of PyTorch, which built on Haskell has some interesting properties as well. Um, basically, there's there's a lot going on, and I think there's still PyTorch has got a lot of momentum, but I don't necessarily think that that's the end of the story. So there's still a lot going on in in this framework space, for sure. Um, so what does Ivy add? I think it's worth, and as best I can, I've tried to place Ivy in the context of the wider ML stack and all of the really important unification efforts that are that are going on. The first thing to say is that um, with, with Quantsight and the uh, Ray API standards, um, this is something that I've put at the top of the stack. In this particular stack, given that it's kind of the user-facing API and trying to create a standard at that level, which is a relatively high level upon which you try to standardize. Um, so then I, we have the framework wrappers, um, and I've put um, Tensely, Neuropod, Think, Keras, and EgoPy. For a detailed 
kind of comparison to, to how Ivy compares to all of these, you, you can check out our docs. In fact, this whole slide is based on the related work section in our docs, which you can go and check out anytime. Um, but I think just to quickly say some of the main points, so, so Ivy has this fully functional API and also the stateful uh, layers built on top. In contrast, EagerPie is just functional. Um, Tensely is also just functional without the, the stateful layers and stuff are really, um, or at least it was the last time I checked. Um, Think is much more uh, stateful. It's kind of more about um, quickly composing um, uh, simple networks and kind of has a functional API, but again, not, not particularly exhaustive. Keras uh, is now deprecated as a, as a unifying framework and it is of course kind of bound to TensorFlow now. A Neuropod from Uber it is kind of much higher level and is really about interfacing the inference of different frameworks and the networks in those frameworks in a shared space. Uh, so these are some of the differences, but the main difference is that Ivy can act as a transpiler. These are all frameworks where the only way to use them is to kind of write new code in this framework and then that code in and of itself is is framework agnostic ivy does that and also makes it possible to use ivy just as an intermediary to convert things between different frameworks um, again and so these are all unifying um, efforts and then ivy i think sits between them because we do fully adhere to the rate api standard and we are also a wrapper framework but also a transpiler so kind of quite a few things in one um, of course, the frameworks, um, these are not unifying to some extent. These are all kind of different instantiations with their own unique APIs, broadly speaking. So these are kind of the fragmented set upon which the framework wrappers try to unify. A bit of a kind of a random one to throw in, but I think it's quite useful, particularly for machine learning frameworks to kind of see the traced graph as another intermediate representation that is actually part of the framework, but very often we do have this intermediate step before then going one level down. And um, yeah, kind of whether that's torch JIT or the Jack's pointer or the TF graph representation, there is often kind of then a graph representation that's built under the hood. Again, these are fragmented, they're framework specific. So then we have the exchange formats and, and given that we've already discussed it a bit, I won't go into a lot of detail, but, but basically these kind of sit underneath the APIs generally, rather than on top of them, uh, which does have advantages because kind of you don't need to wrap all of these arbitrary arguments. So in a way, kind of it, it's a, it, you can have a more minimal intermediate representation, but it's quite, it would be quite hard to wrap all of the functional APIs on top of ONNX, which means that you kind of need, yeah, to some extent, um, it's, it's something that m makes it necessarily harder to plug and play to just kind of um, yeah, take any function from any framework and instantly be able to train it in the new framework. Um, and they, they're a bit lower level than the kind of purely functional APIs that the Ivy operates with. Um, there's then compiler infrastructure, uh, kind of one API, LLVM, MLIR, and Modular, uh, a very recent company this year uh, from the creator of MLIR, um, working on really important unification at the kind of compiler infrastructure level, um, making it very easy to kind of design for multiple hardware targets at once, but again, all a bit lower down the stack. Um, then there's kind of multi-vendor compiler frameworks. TVM is a good one and OctoML uh, from the creators of TVM, really trying to kind of unify the core logic to then be able to compile down to lots of very different hardware targets. Um, these are kind of, these are, these are all unifying as well and, and very important pieces of technology. We then of course have vendor specific APIs, so kind of CUDA um, APIs to their hardware and then vendor specific compilers as well. And I think it's just useful to put Ivy in the context of this. It's, it's definitely higher up the stack, but therefore I think it's very complementary to the efforts here because these can unify kind of underneath these, but if you really want to be able to um, run any code from any of these frameworks in any other, then having a, a unification sat on top is um, it is useful and necessary and complementary to the unifications that are happening underneath. Um, uh, so yeah, so so that's kind of on a high level how Ivy fits into the picture. Um, and again, like I think the main takeaway is that ONNX is one of the clearest comparisons, but this is much more focused on uh, unifying for deployment, whereas Ivy is focused on unifying at train time as well. Um, yeah, so any, any uh, I'll quickly check for hands. Um, 
Any other questions? Not Basically, um, Ivy depends on the frameworks to work at the moment, um, but you don't need them all installed. When you pip install Ivy, um, the only dependency is NumPy, but then kind of if you want to set a backend, that needs to be installed, but you don't like need to install all of them to install Ivy. But yes, it does depend on these frameworks, so it sits above them. We can, we can imagine a future where uh, we end up having kind of C++ compiled directly around Ivy's API. And in fact, it's not Ivy's API, it's the Array API standard. So again, it's not our kind of standard. Um, so if we end up seeing compilers um, designed around that, then Ivy is going to be very well placed with kind of the correct representation, but we're not going to be implementing C++ kernels uh, in the near future ourselves. Um, uh, who are competitors of Ivy in the market? Um, I mean, basically, I don't think there's clear competitors. I don't see anything that's trying to to make all code run together without you needing to write any new code. So, so I actually don't see people trying to solve the same problem. Of course, all of these are the most related work, I think, pretty much. There's a few others, actually, that I still need to add. Um, but, um, yeah, and I think own and X is probably... Um, the most complementary, but again, I think solving quite different things and, and they can both coexist and, and cover different spaces for different reasons. Um, so yeah, I don't see kind of clear competitors beyond these who are all quite different as, as described. Uh, yes, Ivy does support converting training loops from, from one framework to, to another, um, basically. Um, and, and we've tested this um, in 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 um, many cases, um, because yeah, the computation graph that we extract includes all of the array processing that happened. One thing, as we'll touch on later, um, is the fact that Ivy at the moment doesn't support full dynamic control flow. So we don't. I mean, we would we would we would support the translation of a training loop, but the number of iterations in the for loop would be fixed. For example. Um, but we are working on fully supporting dynamic control flow and if statements and for loops as part of the graph, um, kind of using abstract syntax trees. And, and that's, um, yeah, something that we're quite confident we can get working well as well. So basically that the IV has its own um, kind of global default device that's settable and arguments for device. So. Um, I don't fully know what you mean, but Ivy does control the device that the framework is using. Um, no, no, no. So, so Ivy, uh, importantly, um, only actually ever has one framework running at one point in time. Um, so I think kind of what, what's interesting, I, I'll quickly flick back because I think it, it's quite an important point to make. Basically, if we look back at this uh, slide here, there's only ever going to be one backend set. There can be multiple of these. Um, there could technically be multiple of pipeline, but the, the important point is that when it comes under the hood, there's only one of these runtimes running at any point in time, and you're transpiling everything else to that runtime. Um, so we don't kind of allocate the GPU five times for every framework or something like this. No, it, it doesn't because I mean we when we transpile, we're not de deciding the GP the device beforehand. We're effectively transpiling the functional API. So so you could transpile the code on a CPU and then execute it on a GPU. And in fact, if you're you can transpile from NumPy to JAX and then execute that on a TPU. And of course, NumPy doesn't support a TPU. So in a way, the transpilation process is completely. Um, d detached and unrelated to the device you end up running your final graph on. Um, we're not designing with any particular hardware vendor in mind. And actually, this is a very deliberate design of IV, which is to not go any lower than the functional API in Python. We kind of don't optimize any lower than that, and we kind of leave that to others to do, um, because that kind of keeps us as detached and kind of free to, to transition with the future developments as possible. Um, and also, you know, in a, in a um, 
in kind of a positive outcome for Ivy in the future, we can imagine if Ivy becomes the central docking station for machine learning, then then hardware vendors, compilers would want to design around this kind of unified standardized API anyway. And then Ivy could kind of have direct bindings to compilers without needing to rely on the bindings to the backend frameworks that Ivy supports. But at the moment, we only support devices and compilers because the frameworks we support, support them. But that could change in future. Basically, we do have code for this, um, which is kind of more following along JAXA's functional approach with PMAP. But at the moment, uh, the, sh the, 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 the short answer is we're not focusing too heavily on using Ivy as a standalone framework with multi-GPU support. We're focusing at the moment much more on Ivy as a transpiler, which means that um, when you transpile a model, again, you don't need to transpile the multi-GPU support. Kind of the graph itself is quite detached from those considerations. Um, and then you can handle multiple GPUs in the framework that you transpile to uh, in whatever manner that they handle it, which of course is very different depending on model parallelism, data parallelism, um, and so on. Torch uses its own kind of CUDA compatible multiprocessing module. JAX has this kind of fully functional PMAP. Um, we don't kind of try to unify that yet, and it will of course be challenging. So at the moment, it's not really our focus, uh, but, but we have ideas of how we could unify, try to unify that under an interface as well. Um, but certainly a good question and a, and a challenging one. Um, um, so, so Ivy does kind of have its own data structure. Um, it, there's, there's an Ivy array, but it is a wrapper class around the backend arrays. So, um, so, so yes, we, we only ever kind of wrap around the backend arrays um but but what we do basically so the iv array um is, is an array class which has unified um special methods and operators and you can call set item get item so for example you can do in place updates on the iv array even though tensorflow and jax do not support in place updates because they're kind of fully kind of graph constructing operations um, and the way we handle that for example, is by performing a scatter ND operation in the set item special method of the IV array. But we don't kind of have our own C++ or, or kind of our own memory management, but we have our own kind of unified interface of the array, for example. We've really kind of kept everything pure Python that there is that IV has and will only have for a long time, only pure Python code. And we kind of use what the frameworks have and do our best to unify what they have in the cleanest way we can so that we can transpile between the port so we can transpile between the pure python functional apis basically it is the kind of thinking so so that's what the that's what will happen and it's something that i think is going to be a really important use of ivy to kind of automatically find the most optimal not only kind of in a kind of um, search on high parameters and devices and hardware, but also uh, frameworks and framework versions for sure. But I think um, it, it's I think in in the short term we're kind of more catering to people that aren't trying to just decide what framework to use because it's qu quicker. But actually, just people that know what framework they need, they have their whole stack set up, and they just need to get other things in that stack to try it out, other state of the art research, other libraries, and so on. And in a way, that's like the focus. Um, also, because I guess if if performance is really important you end up kind of compiling and maybe just using tensor rt with own and x or something anyway you probably move away from the framework at that deployment time so um but but yeah but but having said all of that um that's something that we've thought about a lot and i think will be really a really nice thing that ivy can do for sure um yeah well the short answer to that question is that Ivy's graph compiler removes Ivy's wrapping. So um, this is kind of why the graph compiler enables things to run very efficiently. But I'll explain more about that uh, later on in the talk. Now let's that. So now let's quickly go through Ivy's design and specifically kind of look at how the same core building blocks enable these two quite different things to, to be achieved uh, by Ivy. So. We already saw this slide, uh, which is kind of the backend API, Ivy's API, and the frontend API. 
So if we put that down for a second and replace it with these three uh, blocks, um, this is kind of the beginning. And we also have the backend handler. I won't go into detail about what that does, although in the in an Oxford lecture I gave a few months ago, I explained this in a lot more detail, so feel free to, to uh, check that out. Um, so yeah, so these are kind of the, the starting points. We also had this slide not too long ago, if you remember, um, basically uh, kind of all the reinvented wheels, Ivy's functional API, Ivy's stateful API. So let's throw away the reinvented wheels. They're not part of Ivy. And basically these are the backend APIs. This is Ivy's functional API. And then we have also parts of Ivy's stateful API, which is where we have all of this Ivy as a framework um, stuff going on, which is the stateful API here, and also the container which doesn't have any relevance for translations, but it makes Ivy as a framework much more powerful. Again, these are parts that I won't go into today, um, but again, the other lecture goes into these in much more detail. Um, and finally, really important piece of code, we have the graph compiler. Um, slightly unintuitively, this is a dependency graph. We might change this in the docs at some point, but actually it starts with code, we compile it and get the graph. But of course, the graph depends on the compiler which depends on the code. Um, and now for these colors, we have kind of A, B, and C, and A are the fundamental building blocks that serve both, um, both roles of Ivy. B is um, the front-end APIs, which are only relevant for Ivy as a transpiler. And then we have the green, which are only relevant for Ivy as a framework. And we can kind of then see how and these building blocks are necessary and useful for achieving both. And I think most importantly for the stuff we'll be going through today, uh, the graph compiler is, is something that's worth diving into a little bit more. Um, basically what we have is, is the graph compiler takes any code and it extracts a computation graph as a composition of the functions in the functional API of the framework that we're compiling to. So let's say that we are compiling to Torch. What happens is we have a function which might include some wrapping around Torch, such as Ivy. Ivy is wrapping around Torch. It might be pure Torch, or it might be a mixture of both. And in all cases, we will just get the pure Torch computation graph with all of the Ivy wrapping having been removed. And this is done using function tracing. Um, Likewise, we might have a, a module um, which kind of uh, hides the trainable layers internally in the constructor. Um, it might just be a super simple kind of one-liner, um, or it might be um, a messy function that includes redundancies um, which aren't actually contributing towards the input-output behavior. And in all cases, we'll get the same computation graph. So basically, in, in a kind of a couple of sentences, the graph compiler takes Python code, as a function with inputs and outputs, traces the static graph that chains them together and returns that graph, which has the um, Python functions in the functional API as the nodes. And the fact that this works for all of these different classes and high level code is because in all of these frameworks, they generally do build upon their own functional API when building high level stuff on top. So we can always trace out and remove the torch NN module and all of the kind of high level stuff. And we can always be left with a fully functional graph a representation of, of what we're trying to transpile or compile, I should say. So I think that's kind of a, a relatively um, quick, but, but sufficient overview of, of the design and with particular emphasis on the compiler. Um, so I'll quickly dive in with another question, mix it up a bit. I see that there was a question from um, Anshu, which is that as the frameworks from which Ivy transpiling from namely Jackson and by PyTorch are under he heavy development and maintenance, at any point in time, one of these frameworks may roll out a change in the API or a better implementation or fixing a bug, um, which still remains in Ivy's implementation. Don't you think it requires a heavy development and maintenance overhead? Um, so I hope I didn't read that too quickly. Um, so um, not as much as you would think. Um, it's in the interest of the frameworks to have very strong forwards and backwards compatibility requirements, particularly uh, forwards compatibility. Oh no, sorry, particularly kind of, I've forgotten which way it is now, I always get confused, but they don't want um, a new release of a framework to break old code. 
basically, um, because that would not be good, obviously. Like all of these third party libraries that depend on Torch that want to upgrade their version of Torch, if that would break all of the libraries, that would be very bad. So this very rarely is a breaking change that happens. Um, there's occasionally functions that get deprecated or moved and stuff, but they don't generally have huge changes to function. If anything, normally the functions become more general with kind of more features and more things that they support. And this isn't a problem for Ivy because if we've got it working in the old version, it all it means on the new version is that we might be missing a shortcut that would make things a bit more efficient. But we can always plug that gap. Um, so yes, so, 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 so in a way it's not like these changes are going to keep breaking Ivy, but it means we do need to keep looking for optimizations and improvements uh, on the API level. Okay, so so going on to Ivy as a framework. Um, so basically, the most important class in Ivy as a framework is the module. This is kind of the it's in every machine learning or, or deep learning framework the kind of thing that layers of a network inherit from, or the entire network itself. And there's these um, one abstract method and, and two kind of optional overridable methods. One is creating variables, um, which is where we define the variables, which are not contained within child modules, but are kind of unique to this um, module at this level in the hierarchy. We have a build uh, private method, which constructs the child modules, such as kind of if it's a network, you might put your linear layers in the build uh, method. You might put some kind of latent variables that are unique to this module in the create variables and the forward pass is required and this is the the yeah well the forward pass of the the, the layer um and in the interest of time i don't think we need to go into all of these but what i will do is just show one of them i think so let's take a look at the linear layer we have a constructor where we have a weight initializer that's configurable a bias initializer that's configurable some some options and so on uh, we obviously um, uh, call the constructor of the base class um, and then we create the variables. Here we have um, a, a create variables uh, method on the weight initializer, likewise on the bias initializer, and then we return the variables as a uh, dictionary. And then the forward pass is purely calling the functional version of linear. And in fact, this is a recurring theme across the board, conf2d, calls the functional version of conv, very similar. LSTM is a bit more nuanced because we have an LSTM update function. So this doesn't, the forward pass is a little bit more, but it's basically just unrolling the intermediate states and calling LSTM update uh, in the for loop. Um, so again, we try to take a design where we heavily compose the stateful API built on top of the functional API um, for kind of yeah maximum abstraction and modular design um yeah so this is a quick overview of what ivy as a stateful framework looks like and and to actually look at a real kind of example we have implemented perceiver io this is a really um impressive general um transformer architecture from DeepMind that showed among many other things state-of-the-art optical flow results um, without having any kind of inductive bias in the design of the architecture. So really just um, learning kind of what sub um, architecture solves this problem, um, which is what transformers are clearly very good at doing. Uh, and we've implemented it here. And and just to give you a bit of an idea of what this actually looks like with a, with a real kind of network, um, yeah, we have a create latent layer, create cross layer, the build method where we build all of the child modules, the pre-norm, the multi-head attention module, um, among some others, a linear module and so on. We create a few variables which are unique to this kind of network, which is a latent set of variables and some decoder query variables, um, which kind of are built on top of the, the compositional child modules that we use. Uh, and then we have a forward pass, which is, I don't know, kind of 100 lines long or something. Um, and yeah, kind of 200 lines. And, and we have uh, the Perceive IO implemented in Ivy. And what we have done is we designed this or we built this by using the DeepMind Haiku Jax um, pre-trained weights from DeepMind repository and made sure that we got identical ImageNet results. 
um, when passing these weights into our IV implementation. So we have kind of numerical confidence that it's exactly the same implementation because we get exactly the same to the you know e to the minus five prediction uh, probabilities at the end, and that's the case with any framework as I'll show now. So. Well, actually, sorry, one other point is that we also have a compile graph function. So um, the graph compiler also plays an important role in making IV forward pass very efficient. So we don't have all of this wrapping overhead, but we just have um, the, the graph of the backend framework that we're wrapping in a very efficient executable graph. Um, so uh, this is the Dalmatian that we kind of are, are doing a bit of comparisons on. Um, it's also the one that is is tested for in the DeepMind repository of Perceiver on the ImageNet Jupyter Notebook. Um, and we can see that regardless of which backend we set for IV, we get exactly the same or almost exactly the same uh, probabilities kind of up to the nearest third decimal place or fourth decimal place. So even though this is a very deep network and even though none of these functions are guaranteed to be the same kernel or certainly not guaranteed to be the same kind of bits. Um, there is, because they are doing the same fundamental maths, um, we don't see these errors propagating through the network to lead to kind of garbage results. It seems based on all the experiments we've done, even though there's numerical variations, it's very stable. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so that's everything is Ivy as a framework. Um, I'll again uh, take a quick look. So I, I see there's um, Anshu. So uh, so I was not asking about Ivy breaking on change in other frameworks. Instead, I was asking about Ivy will require a significant number of developers hours to adapt the change in its implementation of API. Um, yes, but, but um, so you're saying that it would require a lot of time to leverage all of the optimizations that a framework gets when it updates its API. One thing I would say is I think there's a lot, I mean, the functional API of a framework is only a small percentage of the whole code of a framework. It's kind of one little point in the hierarchy that we're wrapping around, but there's a lot of work on the kernels. There's a lot of work on the bindings to hardware. There's a lot more work on the high level classes and all these things as well. So, uh, basically between each version, when you look only at the functional API, there's not that many fundamental changes typically. And even if there are, it's not that hard to wrap them in really. I mean, it's a lot of developer effort now, but that's predominantly because we're writing quite sophisticated continuous integration. Um, we're using very exhaustive hypothesis testing with property based testing and getting that designed correctly and everything, but actually kind of supporting an extra argument here or another data type here and stuff is not, um, is not a crazy amount of maintenance effort. Um, and it's also not strictly necessary. I think bear in mind that for Ivy to be useful. So, I mean, one thing that we'll get to later is the fact that most of the state-of-the-art models are composed with around 15 or so functions. Uh, we'll, we'll get to this soon in the transpiler, but I think ResNet has maybe 19 functions in it. Um, Stable Diffusion has, I think, 15 functions or something. So there's very strongly this kind of 80-20 rule whereby... Um, whereby we don't need to have exhaustive full coverage of every function in the API in a given release for Ivy to be useful. So we're going to very much be focusing on the functions that mostly matter first. And even if there's tail ends that don't get addressed quickly, it's not going to mean Ivy is not, not useful. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so now let's talk about the transpiler. So, um, so basically, this is uh, a, the function signature of a kind of simplified version of the transpiler. So uh, let's say that we want to transpile a function from one framework to another, and we want to do so eagerly so that we do it kind of immediately upon the invocation of the function. Basically, this whole process is broken down into, well, four steps, I suppose. Um, and let's take the example of transpiling this JAX uh, function. Um, which, um, yeah, that's the function that we want to transpile. We want to transpile it to Torch. Uh, 
uh, it has the arguments, uh, which is just uh, the, the x uh, argument, and the keyword arguments are prox true, iters one. Um, and we need to provide the arguments and the keyword arguments so we can do function tracing of the function that we want to transpile. Um, again, so the first step is that we compile the graph into a JAX graph. And an important point to make is that at the current version and the current design, um, we do this by tracing a static graph, which does not account for the dynamic control flow. So effectively, effectively this for loop is kind of assumed constant. Likewise, the approx, because it's not an array, uh, is assumed constant, and only the arrays and the, the path that they go through are treated as the graph. Um, so we get something that looks like this, simply Jax NN Agelu. We've shown true here in orange to show that it's a constant that's kind of cached for this function. And because to keep the graph simpler, we can kind of just remove that and wrap that into this kind of functional node. Um, so this is the Jax graph that we extract. Um, we then need to replace the nodes in this graph with the corresponding front-end functions. So in this case, it's very simple. We just replace uh, jax nngelu with iv.frontends.jax.nngelu. So this is very straightforward. Um, and then what we do is we convert the arguments that were passed from the source framework arrays to the target framework arrays such that we can do function tracing a second time. So we now... Um, turn the JAX array into a torch tensor. Quite simple, we just kind of recursively go through the nest and, and convert um, convert all of the arrays, uh, keeping the values the same. Um, and then we compile the graph a second time, but this time we compile to the target framework. We compile to torch. And we can do this because now this is no longer JAX code. This is Ivy code with a JAX front end. So Ivy code has a configurable backend. So we can just set the backend to torch and we can then trace the graph and get the torch graph out. Um, interestingly enough, for the purpose of demonstration, um, basically uh, just to showcase what happens when you do have an older version of a framework, this is what we get for torch. And the reason for this is because um, at the um, version of Torch that we're pinned to for the purpose of this demonstration, uh, it doesn't support the approximate equals true argument in Torch. So what we then up end up, what we then end up doing is we go. Um, uh, so we we have the Gelu function, which is functional uh, backends Torch activations, and we have Gelu and approximate. We have this uh, compositional. Uh, line because at the point in time that torch is pinned to here, it does not have the approximate argument. In the latest version, it does. So this would be one of those examples where for the next release, we could um, add that support in. Um, but for the purpose of example, we, we've not added it to just show that sometimes you do have this one to many approach in the transpilation. So this is the torch graph. Again, all the constants we don't need to show, they can be kind of wrapped into the, the node. And then we just have, um, and then we have the graph like so. Um, and then we return the graph and that, that's the whole process. So this is kind of how the transpilation process unfolds with compilation, uh, replacing the nodes, compilation again, returning the graph. Um, in reality, we want our transpile function to be more general than this. We want it to be able to transpile entire modules and, um, it, um, and trainable networks and, and so on. We also want it to be able to do this uh, lazily uh, when it's used as a function decorator, for example. Uh, so I'll kind of quickly explain through some examples now uh, how this looks in, in some real world examples. Um, so again, what we, the reason we have this function signature as will become clear soon is so that we can transpile functions, trainable models, or importable Python modules. Um, if no objects are provided, then this can actually be a, a function decorator, um, which then only receives the target framework and it returns a new function, which itself consumes the function. Um, and again, if, if neither arguments or keyword arguments are specified, then the transpilation will occur lazily um, upon the first function call of the transpiled function. Um,
but I think this is much easier to understand with examples. So let's dive into those. Uh, for the first example, we're going to show um, uh, the, the example of transpiling a cornea function. For context, cornea is a PyTorch library for computer vision, a really good, useful library. And we're going to show, in this case, uh, what it would look like if you transpiled a function to JAX. So we start off loading the image into JAX. Um, we then, um, let's say, oh, this is actually something, uh, something I, I have to say a bit embarrassingly, uh, a slide I copied from an ODSC West talk a few days ago. So maybe just pretend that this says PyData instead, um, <laughs> instead of ODSC. Um, so we load this in. Um, we then uh, transpile the function to JAX, uh, like so. So this would happen um, lazily because we haven't provided the arguments for function tracing. Um, and then what we can then do is call the function that's transpiled and then on the first invocation that's when the transpilation happens because it's lazy we get the um we get the edges and then we can call it again um and it will be fast this time because it's been done um i'll also just quickly say i've noticed there's a couple of questions um i will get to those in a few minutes uh, so yeah thanks thanks for asking those as we're going through um Okay, so, uh, and, and then of course, if we, prov if we provided the arguments at the transpile call, it would transpile eagerly, the function tracing would happen here, and then future invocations would be fast. But in many cases, it's more user-friendly to actually do so lazily because you might not know at transpile time what you actually want to pass to the function, whereas at invocation time, of course you know because you're passing it, so yeah. Um, Okay, so now let's do one with TensorFlow and look at a composite function as well, a little bit different. So again, we load the image in. Again, it's ODSC. Um, and let's say now we want to transpile a composite that has two cornea functions. Well, in that case, we can use the function decorator like so um, and just pass in the, the um, framework that we want to transpile to. We don't pass in the function here. Um, but actually the decorator is evaluated and itself returns a new function, which consumes the function to transpile. Um, and then this can work like this. Again, uh, it would be slow on the first call, fast on the second. Um, this time extracting the edges and then dilating them, which is why it's a bit bolder here. Um, and again, we could do this eagerly if we pass the arguments into the decorator and then this would be fast, otherwise it would be slow during the eager uh, call. Um, okay, so then uh, we'll go to trans... Well, I'll actually answer some questions because there are there are a few, so I think that will be good to, to answer a few. So, um, hi, Daniel. Speaking of transpiling networks into multiple frameworks and comparing results, has Ivy so far come across any network configuration which produced different results for different frameworks, i.e beyond unavoidable kernel, uh, unavoidable kernel slash bitwise error? Uh, the answer is no. Um, what we do have is um, the fact that we can't fully transpile dynamic control flow. Um, in those cases, we effectively transpile a single trace of the graph, which of course, if dynamic behavior is important, won't be captured, but that's something that we're working to, to um, fix. Um, but we've not ever seen of course, we could hand construct an example where the kernels are particularly bad at a particularly fragile point in the code, and then it's kind of chaotic and, and we get unbounded errors. Um, but in the kind of neural networks and things we've looked at, this isn't the case at all. It seems as though networks are very resilient to small changes in the values across the depth, and it doesn't kind of propagate exponentially or something like you imagine it could do. It's not something we've observed on anything. We, we've looked at stable diffusion. That was exactly the same on all of them. We've looked at all of the ResNet models and not found anything that moves any more than a, a you know, e to the minus four, e to the minus five um, difference, um, basically. So that that's really reassuring. Um, uh, yes, so the so um, Shrey Joshi asked, do we plan to keep uh, Ivy open source in the future? So all of the front end uh, APIs, the Ivy API and the back end API will all remain fully open source. Currently, the compiler and the transpiler are proprietary and we are still evaluating the kind of open source strategy. It might be that they stay proprietary for a bit longer. 
Um, but certainly Ivy as a framework and all of the functions and the APIs will remain open source for sure. Um, but there will likely, given that we're, we're a startup, there'll be some edges that would remain proprietary. Um, uh, okay, so a few more questions. Um, can I be transpile a model with customly made layer? Suppose you've made a layer, uh, made a PyTorch model which contains customly written CNN. Uh, yes, you can, although what Ivy cannot do, oh, sorry, I should read that out loud. Um, so suppose there's a PyTorch module which contains customly written CNN with few modifications. Um, can I transpile the model to TensorFlow or JAX using Ivy Transpiler? Yes, absolutely. Um, although the limitation at the moment is that we will not be able to transpile custom C++ kernels yet because it's something that won't be mapped in the API. So if you start to add um, new Python functions that don't exist as far as our API is concerned, then we won't be able to do that. Um, but as long as it's a composition of the Torch functional API, which most code is, then we for sure can, can compile any custom stuff at all. Uh, uh, so another question is, uh, what if I don't know the execution framework at the time I'm writing the code? Is there some sort of general backend that can be set at runtime? Well, so, so we do default to NumPy if you don't know. Um, but but with the point with Ivy is that you don't need to know the execution framework when you write the code anyway. Um, and if you want to then just test it out, it will just default to NumPy. Um, otherwise, it would default to whatever the framework of the array, whatever framework the arrays belong to that you pass into the Ivy function. It will kind of then implicitly say, oh, this is a TensorFlow tensor, so let's set a TensorFlow backend. Um, yeah, so, so that's completely flexible for sure. Um, Okay, well, I'll, I'll crack on then, um, just uh, in the interest of time a little bit. Um, um, so, okay, so let's move on to transpiling libraries. Um, so, da, 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 again, so, so let's say we don't want to just transpile a single um, function, but we want to transpile the entire library cornea. Well, in this case, you can write something like this. And what we will get is a new cornea object, which now is primed and is kind of, it is now a TensorFlow library. And what will happen is we can load the image into TensorFlow. Again, no DSC. Um, we dilate images. Um, we define a composite function again. This time, because it is a TensorFlow function, we can actually define it to consume TensorFlow um, tensors straight away. And then um, we call it the first time, and again, lazily, we will do the transpilation upon the first invocation. So this will actually happen very quick, this line of code. We've kind of just primed the, the module such that every function will be transpiled upon the call. And then again, uh, after the first call, it will then be very fast because it's already been transpiled. Um, so again, we're, we're making the Ivy transpile API as flexible as possible. So you can kind of pass whatever you want into it. So we're now going to transpiling models. Um, so basically, again, we can pass in not only a, a, a Python module, not only a function, but a Haiku module, for example. And then we can say we want to convert this to a Torch module and one line of code, and we will then get a module that we can define a Torch optimizer for. We can do a training loop, and just like any other kind of native Torch code, our model is now ready to be trained in Torch from the original Haiku model that we passed in. Um, and I think now it's worth diving a little bit deeper into what this actually does, because there is a bit more going on here than there is in the case of indiv individual functions. Because of course, we need to keep track of the trainable variables. We need to make sure that we're correctly passing those from Haiku to Torch and that they're all allocated in, in the correct place. And that's a little bit more involved than just kind of transpiling a, a standalone computation graph. Um, effectively, it's two parts. We first, uh, call a function from Haiku module, which converts this into an Ivy module. And then we take the Ivy module and convert that to a Torch module. There's actually quite a few slides that explain this in detail, but um, because of the time, I'll skip through those, but I can share the deck afterwards. Um, but suffice it to say that um, what happens is we take the Haiku module, we detect the trainable variables, we assign those trainable variables 
sorry, we assign those trainable variables to the correct place in the Ivy module, and then we implicitly transpile the computation graph from Haiku, sorry, from JAX into Ivy um, by kind of using JAX's front end API. And then what we get here is a framework agnostic module, which has come from uh, JAX, but is now framework agnostic. And then as with a pure Ivy module or a transpired Ivy module, the same either way, we can then very quickly wrap this into a torch module. We, tran we, we compile the graph into a pure torch graph. We um, assign all of the torch NN parameters based on the kind of parameters assigned in the Ivy module. And again, effectively the Ivy module is the intermediate representation for doing transpilations. But I will skip over these bits because uh, there isn't really time, but hopefully that description gave you an idea. But what is interesting to go into is if we now think about converting Haiku to various different models. So again, we start with the Ivy module and then let's say we can convert to a Torch module. We can convert to a Keras module, a Haiku module again. This is kind of coming back to where we started. And it's interesting to look at what happens when we do this. And we have evaluated this. So um, starting off with the original Perceiver IO uh, module, this is the functional breakdown of the original model. So there's 599 add calls, 299 dot calls, etc. cetera. Um, in total, there's 14 functions with 2,049 instances. So now let's look at what happens when we transpile this to Ivy and we go to Ivy's intermediate representation. We now have 15 functions with 2,149 instances. So almost a direct mapping. And in fact, the only difference in this case becomes from one function, which is that at the time of doing this, Ivy did not have an R square root function in the API. And therefore we had to split this into reciprocal and square root in the kind of um, back end of the JAX front end for R square root. So this is kind of where this comes from. But R square root will be added and therefore we would actually have a one-to-one -one mapping in this case. Okay, so very, very clean conversion. And then we're going back to JAX. Of course, this is kind of an interesting point about the one-to-many approach that IV takes during transpilation. We then kind of don't have a, a way yet of, of doing that kind of many-to-one operation fusion. So we kind of are, are stuck then with the reciprocal and the square root functions in the JAX graph without a way to fuse them. I mean, I say that uh, we do actually have fusion. So, so I'll speak in a moment and show that we can remove this. Um, but in the kind of naive approach, this is what we would be left with. Um, TensorFlow, actually 14 functions, um, but more instances. So again, we have the reciprocal, the square root. We this time also actually have that the expandims in Ivy is implemented using TF reshape um, because it was more efficient um, in, in the way we implemented it. Um, so again, small differences here as well. Um, and in the case of Torch, we have 19 functions. We again have the reciprocal square root because of Ivy's bottleneck. We have the reshape thing again, like TensorFlow. But then we also, as we described a few slides earlier, have this Gelu on the, on the pinned version of Torch we have to apply Gelu with the approximate equals true. We have this relatively ugly composition. And again, in the latest version of PyTorch, this is now, um, supported so again this would not be needed in the graph but this just gives you an idea nonetheless it's a much more interesting graph to look at um this than just kind of showing hey they're all identical because actually with the r square root with this the graphs are pretty much there's always a one-to-one -one mapping but i think it's interesting to see some cases where that might not be the case um so here we have 4.8 percent overhead in terms of the number of instances but this is not anything like the overhead of the runtime. We're currently doing the results. I wish I had them to show you now, but uh, basically on everything we've done so far, it's 0.5% in the kind of worst case. So the kind of reciprocal and square root being called instead of R square root is not a kind of big deal breaker. Of course, the big computationally expensive things are the large map models and things like this. So generally speaking, we see very small overhead, even in the case where there's a few extra um, addition of extra functions as a composite, basically. Um, and then with some simple fusion, again, the R square root now, we can do a very simple pruning step and an op fusion, which removes that entirely. Again, importantly, um, 
the results were identical. So we've transpiled the original JAX model. Let's now test it out on this very pretty Dalmatian. Um, again, I think probably up to the closest third decimal place, we have exactly the same results um, again. So what, we, what we've been able to do is within seconds, we've found a Haiku module, we've pressed one button, and we now have that module in any um, class you could dream of with it being um, identical to the original and kind of ready to be trained on your own data and so on. Um, so this is kind of um, a good verification that Ivy's functional API is, is more than sufficient uh, kind of with regards to numerical accuracy to operate as an intermediate representation, even without kind of bitwise guarantees and so on. Um, okay, so I think now is a good time to dive into some questions again. Um, I, I see there might be a few more. Um, so um, can, can Ivy modules, objects, etc., be serialized, saved? Uh, yes, they can. Um, basically, uh, well, we save the weights using HDF5 format or actually um, a pickled representation. Um, so with regards to the graph, it's something we haven't finalized how we will define that file type. Um, so, so actually that isn't implemented yet, um, but definitely it's something that's on the, the, the very short term roadmap to be able to serialize the, the graph representation and also the, the weights as well. Um, yeah. Um, the point of this slide really is just to say that, so Ivy is very deliberately, um, very deliberately not going too low level. So we don't go any lower than the functional API and that is deliberate because it kind of minimizes our own lock-in into compilers and um, hardware and so on. And in effect, Ivy and what we're trying to do is, is just kind of stick with the maths and the functional APIs of frameworks is effectively a purely mathematical realm, kind of matrix multiplies, how should this function behave, etc. And we don't go lower than that. And that, I think, um, given the amount of um, turbulence we've seen in the, the ML landscape, this is something that is very universal and is gonna hold true and kind of means that we can shift in any direction that the field goes. And all that is necessary um, for any compiler designer or hardware designer to plug in to Ivy's intermediate representation. And I would also emphasize, this is not Ivy's intermediate representation. This is the array API standard um, kind of led by Quonsite, which has the backing of, of Google, Meta, PyTorch is on the, is, is working towards adhering to this standard. So it is kind of the standard that exists for array APIs. It's not something that we've invented. So if we see more compiler designers and so on designing around this centralized representation, then um, yeah, it, it'll be very easy for people to plug into Ivy quickly. And when, once you've implemented a hundred or so functions um, which plug into Ivy's API, this compiler, this hardware is instantly accessible to all of the frameworks that exists, all the f versions that exists, and kind of this, this, this view of Ivy potentially being able to be a centralized docking station is something that I think would be very powerful um, for the field and, and mean everything's kind of interconnected in a way that it isn't at the moment. And going further, um, our kind of grandiose vision really is that Ivy needn't remain stuck within the realms of Python either. Um, the intermediate representation that we're operating with, although the implementation today is in Python, again, is, is very much just mathematical really. So we could very easily see a future in which the current version of Ivy is simply the Python backend of Ivy. And we could have a Julia backend or an a Java backend, etc. cetera. Um, so again, I think, um, there's no re reason that this has to be Python limited as well. And therefore Ivy is, is um, trying to position itself to be ready to, to kind of move with whatever the field does. And I think uh, the design gives us a, a better chance of, better chance of uh, succeeding with that. Um, and then finally, just some other points on, um, some other points on uh, kind of what could happen. So, so let's assume that Ivy is able to kind of succeed with this, this vision uh, and is able to connect everything in quite a nice way. Then what all frameworks and all framework versions have access to is, is, a, is a centralized intermediate representation that can be compiled to and transpiled to very quickly. 
And upon this representation, we could build all kinds of useful things, um, such as kind of operation fusion to kind of do many to one graph simplification, tensorized learning, where we, we treat all of the weight matrices of a neural network, not as a load of 2D matrices, um, but kind of a, a whole tensor across the network and do tensor decompositions to effectively compress uh, the, the, the weights, for example, um, we could do source code generation. So at the moment we have this um, relatively human, unreadable, fully functional computation graph when we get to the target framework, but there's no reason that we can't use this to actually generate useful classes and, and source code that people can then use as a starting point to then develop it further in a very intuitive way. And, and compiling to hardware, of course, is something that Ivy actually already supports with the Ivy compile function that wraps the framework specific hardware compilers. Um, so basically with these building blocks, you could do all kinds of things building on top of Ivy's stack, which would instantly work with every framework out there. Um, and we could get some compositions for kind of transpiling as a unify followed by a specify, transpiling for inference, you would compile to hardware, transpiling to kind of customize and do your own research, you would then create Python code representation. So I think there's a lot that can be done on top of on top of Ivy. Um, the final point to make uh, is that very much uh, this is not a sole effort, very far from it. Um, everybody now kind of 520 contributors on the repository all very much deserve um, a mention because uh, everybody's contributed a lot. There's a lot of functions, a lot of unit tests. There's a lot to do to get the kind of the, to get us in a good position to start with. And everybody on this list has done a huge amount towards that. And I want to thank all of them. Um, there's also some people that have kind of particularly helped with the preparation of um, this this talk and some of the results. So I also want to give a bit of a special thanks uh, to them. Um, uh, but just for this talk, I mean, there's, everybody's doing great work in all kinds of uh, areas, of course. Um, and also just to say that we are uh hiring um so uh, we have a very international team we, we have people in 17 countries at the moment all over the world um so very diverse so so that's another point to make 